I'm Amanda Logan. I'm a professor of anthropology and archaeology at Northwestern University in uh, Chicago, United States. Uh, and my, I've been working on the project since 2018. Uh, my role in the project is as environmental archaeologist. Uh, so we're looking at uh, food and environment. In other words, how did a city this large uh, feed itself during the medieval period? Um, but also, how did they use the environmental resources around them? Uh, agricultural land, for example, and how did this change over time? And what might have this had to do with uh, the abandonment of the city? So our primary methods are those of archaeobotany, which is the archaeological study of archaeological plant remains. Um, so primarily, uh, our medium is soil. So we take soil samples from excavations. We uh, expose them to water. This causes all of the plant remains to come to the top, things like seeds, nutshell, wood. Um, most of what we're looking for are charred plant remains, so things that are burnt or carbonized. Uh, as this is how the primary way in which seeds and nutshells preserve in the archaeological record. So we add water to the soil, the uh, remains float out in a machine we've specially designed for this context. Uh, we dry those, bring these back to the U.S., and then identify the different species of seeds and nutshell and wood, and from this are able to recreate uh, diet, foodways, uh, environmental practices, agricultural practices. the lab facilities and the ability to sort of fund the lab work is greater in the global north. Those opportunities are easier to come by. Um, we have expertise uh, in, in Nigeria, Dr. Emobosa Orjemi, uh, who I'm working with now, uh, collaborating on sort of the future efforts at IFE, um, certainly has the expertise, but as many African scholars trying to do archaeological science in a continent, um, there's a lot of sort of day-to-day needs that aren't necessarily filled by the institutions or by the state, such as electricity to power microscopes, for example, or the ability to even fund the microscope, uh, microscopes we need to do the work. Um, the other big issue is to identify seeds of the past. We have to have a known reference collection of modern seeds um, so we can sort of compare their morphologies and things to, in order to make identifications. And unfortunately, the majority of those collections are housed in Europe, uh, which has the best collections, and also in North America. Um, and this relates to longstanding inequalities and how work is funded and who who has the privilege to do the work. Um, we're still in the early days yet of analyzing the, the plant data. It's a very time-consuming process uh, we do back in the labor my laboratory in the United States uh, at Northwestern. Um, we'll be doing a lot more in the next year in particular where we're really going to focus on these analyses, but so far um, some pits from Odudua College, so not this site but one close by, uh, have yielded uh, remains of wheat cotton, pearl millet, and sorghum. Pearl millet and sorghum were expected because these are crops uh, indigenous to West Africa and they've been around for thousands of years. People still eat them, uh, particularly in the north today. Uh, but the wheat and to some degree the cotton was a little bit of a surprise. The cotton speaks of um, a thriving textile industry alongside the other industries we already know of Ife, such as glass beads. Um, uh, but may have been practiced on a different scale, maybe domestic scale, maybe by uh, different uh, uh, gendered roles. So we're investigating that. Um, but we know textiles were really important um, uh, to appearance and prestige in ancient Ife. So it's great to find these results of uh, local um, production of cotton. Cotton, like wheat, though, likely arrived in Ife uh, through the Trans-Saharan trade. Um, uh, wheat is a, so this would have been uh, in the medieval era. Our dates on cotton are uh, 11th, 12th century, uh, which is fairly early for cotton. It's the first um, uh, example of this uh, crop this far south of the Sahara. Uh, and we have quite a bit of cotton. The wheat, though, is uh, perhaps the most exciting find and something we hope to publish uh, with co within coming months. Um, we have the largest collection of wheat in all of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and it's dated uh, fairly early so into the 13, 1200s, 1300s. Um, wheat is a big surprise because it's not something that grows around here today. It's much too humid and wheat is a temperate crop. Um, so this also likely came through the Trans-Saharan trade. It might have had to be brought in through trade with northern Nigeria or other places. Um, and it may be sort of a very uh, restricted in use crop, something that um, maybe only elites or only people heavily involved in this trade uh, would have eaten or consumed. So think of it as a specialty sort of novel food. Um, and indeed, the record archaeological context matches this. It's only in one pit and not all over the site. Cotton is more widespread. Um, 
moving forward uh, collaboratively, I think there's uh, there's two different projects um, uh, I'm trying to work with scholars in Nigeria and other places in the continent to do to help deal with this structural problem. Um, one of them is a grant I was recently awarded to do more work at IFE on uh, environmental conditions um, and environmental health. Um, and that's in collaboration with Dr. Orajemi, who will be doing part of the botanical analyses, pollen analysis, which he's an expert in, as well as parasites, while I will continue to do um, the identification of just the seeds themselves. Um, and written into that, we did something a little different, and we put we proposed that the majority of the analysis funds stay in Nigeria to support that analysis. So that there's no funding on sort of for my lab, it's all going into Nigeria. And I think it's these small sort of structural changes we pe we can begin to make to sort of solve this inequality that exists between scholars in the north and in the south. 